before we start tubes and line, today I'm going to have a good look, Mahamari here. What is, how is the size of an endotracheal tube mentioned? What size? I mean, you say I want an endotracheal tube. Which endotracheal? Sister will ask you what size? What size? You don't know you don't know? Any known. Patients come in all sizes. So if you say any number, it should be right. Eight. Eight what donkeys? Then? Okay. Forget endotracheal tube. You don't work with endotracheal tube. Let's say, how many of you close your eyes? How many of you know you don't have to close your eyes here? How many of you have done an angiogram? How many of you have seen an angiogram being done? Okay, which is the catheter that you see being used? <coughs> which catheter has been used? You have to know angiography, right? They will ask you somewhere or the other something in the MD or the DMD. Which catheter have you seen being used? Sims. Sorry? Sims. Sims. Sims catheter. What does Sims stand for? <coughs> this is the whole, what I call problem, yeah? There is no curiosity. It's across the board of 25 year old. There is no curiosity. Why is it called Sim? It's called Simmons. Who are Simmons? Not interested. Why I'm saying it is important, come become obvious through the lecture, is that unless you are curious, you are not going to do something path breaking. You will be another donkey. You know, in my school group, I asked the question, in the train of life, yeah, in the train of life, what would you like to be? Yeah, close your eyes. Would you like to be a passenger? I'll give you the options. Would you like to be the engine driver? Would you like to be the guard? Or would you like to be the pointsman? A pointsman is a man who changes the point and the direction of the train changes from one track to another track, okay? How many of you want to be the passenger? Okay, please put your hands down if somebody has raised. Please put your hands down. How many of you, please put your hands down, yeah. How many of you want to be the engine driver? How many of you want to be the guard? And how many of you want to be the pointsman? Okay, thank you. So it's sort of distributed equal, not equally at all. In fact, nobody wants to be the passenger, almost nobody. Very few want to be the pointsman, yeah? So, at some point in time, from an average, DNB comes and goes. All of you will pass, sooner or later. After DNB what? Why have you sucked? taken radiology. Why did you become a doctor in the first place? And these are important to me at 65 years of age. I'm trying to convey this to you when you're 25 years of age. There has to be a purpose in what you're doing. And these tubes and lines are so important. And it starts with the fundamental things. It's called SIM1 or SIM2 or SIM3. Why is it called? Ask questions. And when I show what I'm going to show, you'll realize how that makes a big difference in how you think about medicine and radiology and patient care. Yeah? The reason I'm teaching it, teaching here, is I want to change the way radiology is trained. There is nothing here, almost nothing here, that you cannot learn from books. What I'm trying to tell here is what you cannot learn from books. It's a small part, but that's, according to me, an important part, like you'll see in this lecture. Yeah. So whatever you see, ask why. The worst will be, I don't know. My son is mad, he's an engineer. He has to tell him why, why, why. I don't know. Medicine doesn't know the answer. For example, this answer, this is called Simmons catheter. Why is it called Simmons catheter? Who was Simmons? And what is the beauty of the Simmons catheter? What is the beauty of the Simmons catheter? It's a reverse curve catheter. Yeah. So if you want a Simmons catheter for a Bachu who is two years old, what what is the number you'd say? What number? Usually three French or four French. What are the question you'll ask if I say three French or four French? Anyone, what is the question you'll ask when I say three French or four French? The obvious question is, what the hell is French? Yeah? The next question is, why is it called French? Homework. And last time I gave a whole lot of homework. Nothing is coming here. Anybody writing down homework, please write down the homework and give the chip, the paper to me next time. Because if I give you homework and you don't read about that, there is no point in these lectures because I give you more homework than I talk here. Yeah. 
why what is a French scale yeah and why is it called French scale so you typically say that I want a five French catheter three French units are one millimeters yeah and this refers to outer diameter all the time in any hollow uh, tubular structure we are talking most of the time on outer diameters unless specified otherwise yeah for example it's so strange we talk of catheters in French scale which is actually <coughs> in millimeters I told you three French is one millimeter but the guide wire diameters is expressed in which unit it's in inches the length of the guide wire is in centimeters and the diameter of the line is in <coughs> your boss is talking one second Hello, why are you troubling me? Yeah, I have reached your virtues are around me and I'm troubling them. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. You're lucky you have a teacher. Let's go. You get what I'm saying? The length of the guide wire is 150 centimeters or 180 centimeters. The diameter of the guide wire is 38. It said 38. Why is it called 38? Do you know why it's called 38? It's 0 0.038 inches. That's why it's called a 38 wire. And it's hilarious, absolutely. Diameter in uh, in inches and length in centimeters. Now they have started mentioning the diameter also in uh, centimeters or millimeters, actually. So you have to ask, I want an endotracheal tube. There is a number to it. And homework for you, endotracheal tube numbers, nasogastric tube. I like to call it nasogastric rather than Ryle's tube. So you do, it's more accurate, I think. You can, eponyms, using eponyms. What is an eponym? Name, after Name after somebody, yeah, who first described it. And there is a whole lot of controversy. <coughs> Should it be called Hansen's disease or Hansen disease? It's not as if Hansen had a disease, yeah? There's very interesting English language discussion on that. So when we talk of nasogastric tubes and we talk of endotracheal <coughs> tubes, we talk of the diameter in numbers, yeah? That's for example, you say 14 number, 18 number, and you tell me next time what the number stands for, yeah? So we, let's see, first we'll talk about endotracheal tubes. Yeah, you have an endotracheal tube here? Mm -hmm. Somebody said, do you have an endotracheal tube here? It's packed, is it? You have an open one? No, I don't think it's fair. <coughs> well, I'll show you in pictures. I'll load my pen. You have another USB? Sorry. Cube, I press B, it blanks. So I press B, it comes back again. <coughs> uh, before we talk about endotracheal tube, I, I don't have pictures of that. I'll mention about central lines. Yeah? Uh, central lines, most of the time these days, are jugular lines, sometimes subclavian lines. Nobody puts a, a peripheral line commonly. I don't know if chemotherapy, they may put a PIC line. What is the full form of PIC? Very good. And it's catheter, it's not catheter. Yeah? It may be cathedral, but it is catheter. And we did a study at my hospital, and 80% of central lines are wrongly put. The correct position of any central line, whether it's trans jugular or whether it's subclavian, 
is that it should not be above, below the level of the carina. And it should not be in the jugular vein. So somewhere in the mid portion of the superior vena cava is the correct position. But that position depends on the position of the neck. Yeah. So if it is, again, we'll talk about that in an endotracheal tube and we'll see about that. So looking at the position of the central line is very easy. Two things are important when you look at PAX monitors. One, change windows. Every single time, when you're looking at plane films, change windows. So that you see the lungs and heart properly in one window, and if it's not a high KV picture, you will not see the spine. Change the window to see the spine every single time. And if you're looking at small bones, for example, use magnification. Ideally, if you have time, you mag everywhere, every single time. Yeah? If you don't change the windows, you are missing findings. Once in at least 10 times. And this is a habit that you should have. And that's something I learned very late in life. Change the windows. Look at the spine window. If you have a shortcut, use that. Yeah? Or, and, or magnify. Don't ever look at hand x-rays or look at foot x-rays without mag. Yeah? Mag and keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. No shortcut to giving enough time. Yeah? Same thing about lines. You may not see a nasogastric tube, I'm sorry. You may not to see a central line or an endotracheal tube properly unless you change the windows. Yeah, if the portable is poorly done. Every single time you sing a song, when you have a critical care x-ray, tubes and lines, tubes and lines, tubes and lines. You can either report the rest of the x-ray first or you report the tubes and lines first. I like to report the tubes and lines first because critical care people at our hospital don't look at it properly. I don't know what it is like here. And you'll see the same mistake day after day, day after day, and you have to call up the ICU and tell them, for God's sake, change this. Otherwise, I'm going to sue you. And then somebody will go and reposition the tube. So, and whether they do it or not, is your job to say that this is wrong or this is right. So first thing, the central line may either come from the jugular vein or it may come from the subclavian vein. If it comes from the subclavian vein, the chances of complication in the pleura, the chances of complication in the lung are vastly more than when it comes from the uh, jugular vein. So you look for pneumothorax and you look for pleural effusion uh, or hemothorax in a trans subclavian approach. Where, you look, where will you look for uh, hemothorax in a, in a chest film? These films are mostly supine and the blood will come collect at the apex. So if you compare the left side and the right side and you find an apical pleural cap on one side, suspect that there is pleural uh, blood, I mean if there is hemothorax. Yeah? And if this patient has uh, <coughs> um, if this patient has abnormal clotting parameters, he could bleed to death. There is nothing that will prevent that subclavian vein from bleeding. So usually these days, when you puncture below the middle third of the clavicle, touching the clavicle and puncture the subclavian vein, they will not counterpuncture. Mm -hmm. You understand what is counterpuncture? You puncture only one wall, you don't puncture the other wall and then withdraw and see if it is in the vein. Because if you do that and the patient has abnormal pa uh, coagulation parameters, he could do. So if you see an apical pleural cap on a supine film in a patient who has for the first time had a subclavian line, call up the ward and say there is something wrong. And as far as tubes and lines are concerned, it is not about the return report. It is about conveying to the concerned people as soon as reasonably possible. That means if you're doing it at 8 o'clock in the morning and the line has been put at 6 a.m. or the line has been put at 6 p.m. the previous night, Go call the ward, run up to the ward, do what you want till they get the message that this is wrong. Oftentimes they will say that, yeah, we know about it, we are working on it, doesn't matter. Your job is to tell the ward because you can save lives. You can save lives with wrongly placed central lines. You can save lines, of course, with uh, endotracheal tube. And surprisingly, you can save lives even with nasogastric tube. So the wrongly positioned central lines are one which is not where I said, that means it is not above the carina, below the jugular, I'm sorry, <coughs> below the superior vena cava, so somewhere in the mid SVC, 
a line which is in the right atrium is a complete no-no. Because two things can happen, it can produce atrial, some sort of rhythm abnormality and it can perforate. And again and again and again you will see lines which are in the right atrium. And why? Because this is complete unadulterated stupidity. Because that cover says that make sure that it is 4 to 6 centimeters from the punctured line. That's for Americans who are average 5 feet 8 in the stall. And these idiots do the same thing. Yeah, 6 to 8 centimeters from the puncture point and the damn thing is in the right atrium. I've seen lines which are in the IVC. And you cannot have it in the right atrium at all under any circumstance. They have to change it. And you have to tell them that it is wrong. So the maximum that you can allow <coughs> is slightly proximal to the mid portion of the SVC. And you get a sense of what is mid portion of the SVC when you see the change in direction. Yeah, I, if I have, I'm, unfortunately I don't have pictures to show the central lines and it's not a big deal and you see the line, you see the tip, change the windows, magnify and see which is the real tip. Sometimes you get carried away by a wrong tip being I mean, seen on a non-properly uh, exposed phone. <clears throat> and the other thing is that um, if there is a left-sided jugular line, most of the jugular lines are right-sided because easy. Yeah. If you see a left jugular line, that left jugular line has to come in the left innominate vein all the way up to the SVC and turn down like the right jugular line. It cannot go and hit. For example, if this is the right wall of the SVC, the patient is looking at you, the left jugular line comes like that, naturally it goes and hits. It can perforate and this is a real danger. It has to be repositioned such that it faces downward like this. You understand? A curve like that comes like that, not like this, but down. It, this is like a needle. It should, like the right subcavian line, be pointing down. Again in the mid portion. So coming from the left side, pointing it down like this is not easy. So people trying to avoid <coughs> the left jugular line as much as possible. And the left jugular line sometimes is in the left innominate vein, not acceptable. The smaller the vein, the greater the chance of thrombosis. Yeah, and I often say, I mean, people laugh at me when I say that. The left jugular line is in the distal portion of the right jugular vein. It does all sorts of things. It comes down from here, it comes into the innominate vein, it comes into SVC and it goes up like that. No line, no line should be against the direction of flow of blood because there will be turbulence and if there is turbulence, there is chance of clotting, clotting means trouble and infection especially in all of these patients who are comorbidities. Sometimes you have a right jugular line going down to or, um, going down the innominate vein into the axillary vein and sitting there for days and weeks. And if I take a picture and go to court, the whole, whole hospital is finished. So nothing is impossible as far as the lines are concerned. There is no shame when you put a line, it being in the wrong line, in the wrong place. It happens, yeah, you're doing blindly under ultra ultrasound guidance. But what is unacceptable is that having seen, and they always, every single time, will do a film after doing a, putting a line to check. It is already done, always done. And when you check, and you don't look at the lines, and don't change the position, that is not acceptable. You see it on the wall, you see it on the wall around, you don't change the position, that is not acceptable. It has to be repositioned immediately. So there is no big science involved in jugular lines. You see the position of it, you change the position at that's the end of the story. You should know what the normal position is. No right atrium, no line against blood flow. All lines, I'm not saying preferably, all lines should be in the right superior vena cava above the level of the carina, that's that's the watchword. Above the level of the carina, yeah. And this is the unit. This is the guideline of the um, Society of Intervention, no, Society of Critical Care Medicine of the USA, and it has been adopted by the Society of Critical Care in India that it should be above the level of the carina. Okay, so if you say that in an exam, you're fine. In real life, this is what you're looking at, and according to me. The, tube, the line that I see in our hospital, 90% of those lines are wrongly placed. 
and 80% of the time nobody cares when you go and tell them for God's sake change it, who will do it? Nothing happens. This is the response uh, that you get and it's quite callous when people say nothing happens. And this nothing happens goes around all our Indian nation, nothing happens. Okay, now what happens? When you put in a line, you take a firm, make sure that it's proper. When you take out the line, if it's a jugular line, there is no need to do a follow-up x-ray. Because if there is a hematoma, it will form in the neck, and you can always compress. People compress it. And we have been puncturing carotid arteries for donkey's years, we just compress it. Yeah? So nothing is going to happen intrathoracic when you take out a jugular line. On the other hand, if you take out the subclavian line, and especially if the bleeding parameters are abnormal, it could bleed in the thorax, so you do a follow-up x-ray after removing a subclavian line. All the time, remember that these patients are supine. So the pneumothorax will be at the apex, in the upper zone. The hematoma will be in the apex. And all of that is automatically registered by you, knowing that this is a supine film. And most of the time, it is difficult, or it is difficult mentally for the ICU guys to take upright views. They'll give all sorts of excuses why upright views cannot be done. Yeah. So the place that you look for is at the uh, apex of the lung. If, if next time I remember, I'll show you some pictures of wrongly placed central lines and some complication thereof. <clears throat> now when you come to the endotracheal tube, I have said that uh, we talk of the diameters of the endotracheal tube. Not that it is relevant to us as far as this is concerned. It is relevant as far as curiosity is concerned. All of you are bright guys, no? Top of knee, bead, all that lafra. Then why don't you ask questions? If you don't <coughs> ask questions, you will read what is in the, it's called garbage in, garbage out. And you don't need a human being to do garbage in, garbage out, no? So, homework is what does that number mean? Yeah? 7, 8, 10, whatever size endotracheal tube. Similarly, with uh, nasogastric tube, we say give me 14 size nasogastric tube whatever, what that 14 means. So we'll talk about the <coughs> endotracheal tube and all the pictures that I'm showing, I've done at the age of 65, yeah? I don't have to show up, but I'll make it a point. I'm curious, I'm innovative, and I have a solid kida. You know what's kida, no? Want to do something, 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 all the time. So all of these are done on a Sunday. <coughs> early morning before the house wakes up because I'll get bhatti if I do all these things at home. And most of the time it is simple logic, it is simple common sense, it is the urge to want to do something new and especially about the nasogastric tube that you'll see has never ever been done in the world. It's not published literature. For the first time such things are being done and I'm going to tell you for the first time you'll be hearing your ICU guys will not know, I promise you that. There's only one person so far I've come across who knew what I'm going to say. Yeah, as far as the nasogastric tubes are concerned. Okay. So you think I'm showing off? You think I'm showing off? I don't care. I'm not showing off. I'm simply making a point that always use your brains. Always find out innovative ways of doing things. Yeah? <coughs> What is the goniometer or is it goniometer? Yeah, it's a goniometer, yeah. It's something to measure angles. So I took a piece of cardboard, cut it into two pieces like this, put one of those, uh, what do you call, clips that you use for notice boards and you get a whole grown <coughs> goniometer because I wanted to measure angles. <coughs> I'm sorry, this is what. <coughs> this is my colleague. <clears throat> the position of the endotracheal tube keeps changing between flexion and extension. That is what I'm going to say. And because the arc changes, the length changes. And we'll know why it is important. I used to teach for a very long time the wrong thing about what happens to the tip of the endotracheal tube between flexion and extension. Okay? <laughs> Close your eyes. Close your eyes. How many of you feel intuitively that when the neck is extended, the endotracheal tube goes down deeper. How many of you feel that when the neck is extended, the endotracheal tube comes out? 
the others are neutral. Okay, fine. <clears throat> so what happens is that I sort of measured the distance from the uh, suprastellar notch up to the uh, up to the what that higher cartilage, top of the thyroid cartilage, between flexion and extension to show that the length of the trachea significantly changes between extension and flexion. So you can see that between extension and flexion, it's nine centimeters or whatever, five centimeters or so. So there is a difference of four. In this case, uh, one of my consultants has got a long neck and it sort of exaggerates. And there is a four centimeter difference between flexion and extension. And those of you who said that the tube comes out in extension are right. It comes out in extension because the length of the trachea or the air passage, as you will, comes becomes longer. Yeah, and see this picture now. Something page down, but it should go down. No? Yeah. All of this is home grown from stuff that is available at home. You take a rubber band, you take a little bit of super glue, you take scotch tape, and this is what I'm showing, and a match tape. The match stick is the common level of the carina or the of the glottis. Yeah? When you extend, when it is in neutral position, for example, neutral position of the jaw, this is the distance. Yeah? You got it? The tube is fixed at the mouth here. The tube is fixed at the mouth. The position of the glottis remains the same, or carina remains the same, sorry, not the glottis. And in extension, the length of the air passage becomes small, and that is relatively upper upward displacement of the tip of the endotracheal tube. So you get this picture into your head. And most of you who raise your hands for this are right. That the endotracheal tube comes out in extension. I used to think that because you extend the damn thing will go down. Yeah? It comes out. And why does it come out in extension? The length of the carina. I'm sorry, the length of the trachea from the carina will become small. Just the opposite happens in flexion. The length of the air passage becomes less, and in flexion, this tip of the endotracheal tube goes towards the carina. Okay, is this clear? So when you look at a radiograph, everybody will tell you that in an adult, the endotracheal tube should be about three to four centimeters above the level of the carina, means nothing. You have to relate that to the position of extension or flexion of the neck. Yeah? How do you do that? Let's see some examples. Yeah? How do you know on a frontal radiograph whether the whether the neck is in flexion or extension? Anyone, common sense. Anyone we see the see? mandible and the occipital. Yeah. You look at the mandible. If you can see the mandible clearly and the teeth clearly, for example, then it means that it is in steep flexion. And if you can see the occiput, it's in extension. So it's easy, it's possible. Yeah, non radiologists don't know this unless somebody has taught them. Yeah, so two things you should remember. First thing you see the position and this is extremely critical in Bachulo. In adults it is not so bad because the margin of error is much more than in children. Yeah. So if you're looking at pediatric, be very careful to see the tip of I'm sorry, this is making too much noise. I'm not making noise. It, it, the tip of the nasal, I'm sorry, endotracheal tube to the carina distance in relation to whether the neck is in flexion or not. So uh, the way I report it is that the tip of the endotracheal tube is at the carina, for example, with the neck in steep flexion. Yeah, that means if you extend the damn thing will come up, it's okay. On the other hand, if it is near the glottis, very, very proximal, in flexion, and if the head is extended or main neutral, the tube will come out. That is killing. You cannot have a tube coming out, but you can have a tube going into one main bronchus. That's okay. One bronchus for a short time is okay, but coming out means everything is gone. So if the tube is too far proximal, yeah, you run to the ward and tell them it's too far proximal, change it. Typically what happens is an x-ray is done, yeah, the unit people will see it before us. Sometimes we will see it before them. And irrespective of who sees first, your job is to call up the unit, somehow see that it reaches the uh, referring physician. Yeah? It happens off and on, once or twice a month. I tell the resident, go tell the what. And eight out of 10 times they know, two out of 10 times they don't, and it's worth it. Go to the ward, call up the sister, whatever you do, yeah? 
if the elevator is full, run 12 floors. Because it's a matter of saving lives. I am not kidding. This is for real. And again, I repeat, it's rarely that you get an opportunity as a diagnostic radiologist to save life, and this is one opportunity. So what is the moral of the story? See the position of the tip of the endotracheal tube in relation to the position of the neck, and that is done by looking at the chin. Often in bachus, you will see in the chin, even in adults many times you will see the chin. If the chin is not there, not seen, or the occiput is not seen, very difficult to tell whether it's flexion or neck uh, extension. Even then, even if you cannot see the flexion or extension of the neck, if the tube is critical, very close to the carina, or way out, you go tell them if something is wrong. <coughs> okay, when I say go tell them, I'm repeating for the hundredth time, you call and tell the resident, or you go to the ward and tell the resident something is wrong. The resident is OR and washed up, all that is not acceptable. Somebody has to come to know, especially in children, that the tube is wrong. Yeah. So this is a stylized representation of what exactly happened. So there is no doubt in any of your minds when it will come out and when it will go. And remember that the length of the trachea or the air passage becomes more in extension. That doesn't take any genius and therefore you will remember that in extension the tube will come out. You got it? Because this distance from the mouth to the tip of the tube is constant. Is the air passage that is changing and all that uh, maramari happens. Yeah? Okay. <clears throat> so this is the easy part. Nasogastric tube, you ask, most people will know. Yeah, they will tell correctly, like you people have said, that in extension it comes out, in flexion it goes in, most people will know. But nasogastric tube is ignorance, complete total ignorance. Yeah? At the end of this class, I'll ask you some hands up, hands up stuff and you'll know what exactly is going on, yeah? <clears throat> now, intuitively, if you know the gastric tube, the usual, sorry, kuch farak It can make a big difference, yeah? We start with the nasogastric tube, and I took some, sorry. Why am I doing right click here? I'm pressing this and this here. Let me go back, no, this is trouble. So can somebody go on that? So if you have to go from here, you have to click on the icon, as far as I know. Okay. This is fascinating, completely fascinating, yeah? The nasogastric tube has multiple side holes, and it is also a radiopaque marker line. All of you know that? Mm -hmm. Anyone doesn't know, hands up. Okay. The most interesting part in that there is only one side hole which comes on that radio pick marker, no matter the size of the tube, no matter the brand of the tube, without exception, the only hole that comes on that line is the proximal most side hole. Yeah, remember this, without exception. You can open this tube if you want and see afterwards. So when you see that line on the x-ray, and there is a break, and that break corresponds to the proximal most side hole. And that is the only thing that you are looking at. Yeah? For all practical purposes, you are not bothered where the tip is. Yeah? I'm, I'm just being a little exaggerating here. But what you are looking at, not the tip, but you are looking <coughs> at the proximal side hole. My reports will always, always read the proximal right side hole is here, and you'll know why. Yeah? So this is, this is what I said, the only side hole which is seen or which is manufactured on that radial opaque line is the proximal most side hole. Clear? This is all that you need to know for the rest of it. So sitting at home on a Sunday morning, this is what I made. I made a lower esophageal sphincter. I made a upper esophageal sphincter. The same plastic bag. The segment between this and this is the esophagus, short congenitally short esophagus, whatever you want to call that, and the, that other part is the back, is the stomach. This is what I call application of mind. You keep thinking, 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 you say, how do I show it? You don't need any fancy stuff. You need a tube which is notified from the hospital. You need a couple of letters, I mean rubber bands and a bag. 
Am I trying to show that I am smart? I don't know to show. I am what I am. What is important for you to understand that it is possible to go beyond the ordinary and do some funny things, no, interesting stuff. Uh, so what I did here, and this is the first picture, has no magic in this. You see the tip of the nasogastric tube, and you see the lower esophageal sphincter, you see the upper esophageal sphincter, you have a stylized representation of where the stomach is, where the esophagus is, and what is the relationship of the tube. So the first picture, I, I just wanted to show the importance of the proximal interfalic, I'm sorry, proximal side hole, yeah? So this is what I did. <clears throat> Can you make out? The image on your left has the proximal side hole, which is the hole that you see on the x-ray below the lower esophageal sphincter. Mm -hmm. So you see that damn thing, you see a hole, most of the time you will see it, yeah? And if it is below the lower esophageal sphincter, the lower esophageal sphincter is not at the level of the diaphragm. Usually it is typically about one, you people do esophagogram, no? Hundreds of them. So next time you do look at where the lower esophageal sphincter is, it's about a centimeter or 15 millimeters below the lower esophageal and below the dome of the diaphragm, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing that the non-radiologists have to understand. It's not there. So if the proximal side hole, the only hole that you need to look at is below the lower esophageal sphincter, well below, I mean 1.5, 2, 3 centimeters, then you are safe. Anything that you inject will go into the stomach, the image on the left, yeah? And common sense, if the proximal side hole is above the lower esophageal sphincter, I mean proximal to the LAS, this is what happens. The patient is somite, there is masala going into the esophagus, the patient aspirates. So when you do this, the end of all this, is that you have to see that the proximal side hole is well distal to the lower esophageal sphincter. This is while injection, yeah? Now you're trying to empty the stomach, what happens? This is what happens. You aspirate like this, for example, from the distal, from those side holes which are inside the stomach, this is a rasna of liquid huh? from our, our home and that's the kitchen platform. Sunday morning home is sleep. That liquid gets into the nasogastric tube, yeah? It flows through the nasogastric tube and from the proximal side hole it comes out into the esophagus and it can aspirate. So both while injecting and while emptying the stomach, yeah? If the proximal side hole is proximal to the lower gastroesophageal junction, the patient is in trouble. Yeah? How many of you knew this before what I said? So go ask a crowd of 5,000 intensive care people, there will be maybe one hand. It's such a fundamental, simple thing, and that's why I went to town making this experiment on God birthday from my wife. Ravi Rasna powder ki hai. No kidding, huh? And it literally, you know, spill on the, it happened to spill on the kitchen platform because the upper sphincter was uh, lax here. It was like aspirating into the lung. I cleaned it up. It's so amazing, you know. I did everything. She wakes up at 9 in the morning. All this was happening at very early in the morning. I cleaned up everything, put everything properly, abolished all evidence. And she gets up. She's also a radiologist and says, Ravi, rasna powder ki I said, kuch malum nahi. No, I had left it in the window, in the door yesterday, no, it's inside now. <laughs> Women, no trouble. <laughs> so this is what I'm trying to show. The proximal side hole is here, yeah? And you're aspirating and the thing can aspirate. <clears throat> On the other hand, when the proximal side hole is inside, there's no way it can dig into the esophagus, yeah? So this is, this is the be all and end all of everything. On every single uh, nasogastric tube, you change the windows, you magnify, you do what you want. Yeah, especially in infant feeding tubes, you may not be able to see it well. You have to identify. So my typical report is this: the tip of the nasogastric tube is not seen. Sometimes it's not seen, but the proximal side hole is distal to the gastroesophageal junction. I am not most of the time interested in the tip. Sometimes it's it's funny. The tip will do a U-turn and come back into the esophagus. So 
theoretically speaking, 999 times out of the time, you are safely home by looking at the proximal side hole. Yeah? Sometimes the tip does funny things. And where do you look for if there is a nasogastric tube or not? The best place to look at is the suprasternal area where you see just the blank, black air. Yeah, you don't look at the stomach. You don't look at the esophagus. <coughs> you look here. And if you see that line like that, you know for sure that there is a nasogastric <coughs> tube. Oftentimes, you retrace it from the top every single time. If you magnify and if you change windows, you will be able to trace it. All sorts of things happen. It loops backward and comes into the pharynx. It loops backward and comes to the posterior third of the tongue. It does all sorts of things. And worst of all, it's nicely in the stomach. I call it the peeping tom nasogastric tube. Just the tip is in the stomach. The proximal side hole is proximal to this. It's like a song. The nasogastric tube is far too proximal in the esophagus. The proximal side hole is proximal to the pro lower gastrointestinal function. Please reposition the tube such that the proximal side hole is distal to the lower esophagus. It's like a song, and my colleagues sitting there get boppers. It's like a song you sing. Yeah. So this is all that you know. Of, want to know about this? And anybody want to teach about this and borrow my pictures? Welcome. Yeah. They are available on the website. You can go and take them. Any questions so far? This is so simple, commonsensical logic. Yeah. I know PowerPoint. Don't tell me. Yeah. So this is about the nasogastric tube, and this is all that you need to know. There are no exceptions to the rule that the proximal side hole is the only side hole which is on the mark. I told you for the under time. Even if you take an endotracheal, uh, if you take an infant feeding tube. So this is about the endotracheal tube and the nasogastric tube and the central line. Yeah. As far as the central line, be more careful of the subclavian line and jugular lines. If you look at the position, there's also a lot of stuff written about uh, the position of the neck and the central line. It doesn't change as much as the endotracheal tube does. So you don't have to bother too much about the center line. Yeah? And uh, there is nothing more about the endotracheal tube. You have to be cautious that if it is too far in, in near the carina, and for example, if the neck is in extension, if the child flexes, it can go into one bronchus. Most of the time, it will be in one bronchus. The other thing which has never been written up, and this is Ravi's invention, is this. And uh, do I have pictures? I don't think I have pictures. Let me see. Uh, you have to be a little patient with this one. So, how do I go up on this? Back, no. There's no back on this. RR USB. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go back on this and I go to RRTF. And if you see, no, there are hundreds of those images of nasogastric tube and Endotracheal tube. It's easier to go down like this. So I'll quickly run through these X-rays. Yeah, you'll see one by one. So this is what I meant by flexion. This thing is in flexion. Yeah, <clears throat> and it shows this. This is what I meant. Again, you can't see the endotracheal tube very clearly unless you change the windows. So these are JPEG images, so I cannot change the windows. I'm just quickly, quickly running through the pictures. Yeah, this is one. What's happening now? <clears throat> what? This is photo viewer. How do you go to the next one? Like this. Yeah. Here, the endotracheal tube is in the right main bronchus. Yeah, this is classic, and the left lung is collapsed. This is where you run. You don't walk. You don't wait for the elevator. You run. If this lung remains collapsed, it may never expand. And this is a bachu. And see the position. This neck. Most of the time in bachu, the neck is in flexion. Yeah. If they extend the tube, may come out a little bit. But this is something. <clears throat> and look at that nasogastric tube. I call it number 66 root. It goes all over Bombay. It's round, round, round. It's gone all over, right? The same patient, the tube has been pulled back, and the lung has expanded. 
and the level, and the endotrine, I'm sorry, the central line is okay. I mean, it's distal end. So I typically say that it's the SVC RA junction. Yeah, that's still about okay, not too bad. <clears throat> Here again, the lung is collapsed. Left lung is collapsed. The mediastinum is shifted to the left. There is no lung on the right, no heart on the right side of the right border of the spine. There is my national anthem. No heart on the right side of the right border of the spine. That means something is pulling the lung, or heart to the left side, or pushing the heart. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> and then I can't really see the nasogastric tube on this. You'll have to change the windows and see that. I'm looking for something very classical here. Look at the titles. Where do you see the file names on this? Yeah, I know, but where are the file names? Okay. This is a PDA clip, so don't mistake that. These are all virtues from cardiac terror, post op surgery. And let me go back and I'll show you. <coughs> So you see that in this patient, the nasogastric tube again is too far proximal in the stomach. Can you see that? Mm. Mang is what? Plus plus? Okay. <coughs> Mang one plus. And the endotracheal tube is where it is. Yeah, proximal third of the bronchus of the trachea. I mean, it's difficult to see, but you can, this is what happens. Most of the time, you don't see it well enough, but you window and maximize. So I think it's here somewhere. there. Now, now it has become automatic for me. When there is an endotracheal tube and a nasogastric tube, the first tube that comes out yeah, as the patient progresses is the endotracheal tube. So I call this the endotracheal tube and the nasogastric tube are bad partners. What often happens is that, not often, every single time virtually, you take out the endotracheal tube and in the pharynx, the endotracheal tube pulls the nasogastric tube out. Yeah. And this has not been described anywhere. It's my first observation, and one day I'll publish it. Because this is important. <coughs> See what has happened. The endotracheal tube is out, and the nasogastric tube has moved just beyond the gastric. And this happens very often. And sometimes when they take out the nasogastric tube, the endotracheal tube comes out. So this is something, this combination is something that you have to look at. Yeah? <coughs> so there are so many examples of this which is ETT, NG, NGT, ETT, NGT, and not as far as I know, it has not been described, and be aware of it. All along, you get the impression that I'm showing off? I'm not showing off. There is no reason for me at this age to show off. All that I'm saying is that have an open mind, be curious, and want to have fun, do something different, I'm going home. Yeah? Sure. How to go and start it Any questions? Okay, close your eyes. Last question. How many of you know what I said about the endotracheal tube? Is there anything that you learned? How many of you learned something new? Most of you. And down. How many of you did not know? No. How many of you knew about the proximal sidewall? Okay, open your eyes. Go propagate this worldwide. Yeah? And if you, and if you find references somewhere which says what I have said, please let me know. Raviramakantan at gmail.com. Very easy, yeah? 
because this is so fascinating and I knew it now, last five years. Before that I didn't know because I'm not reporting every single ICU x-rays. Never too late to learn, okay? So let's stop. And 